Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and the most heartfelt salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the stream, I was going to say the stream.tv. I did <laughs> that like for, that. I did that for two years, <laughs> but we've been here for six months. We are in Burbank, ladies and gentlemen. My wires are so crossed. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> John Schnapp. Hey, I know we've been at AMC Movie Talk. I mean, Collider. <laughs> Collider Movie Talk for quite a while. We love You're being here. You're a good here. man for covering What's me. What's going on, everybody? Also, here is Christian Harloff. Oh, I mean, Mark oh, Ellis. I oh. take another sip of heartache, boys, because you Burn. can't drink the stream in AMC away. <laughs> the beloved Pixar animated film Finding Nemo came out in 2003, and now almost 13 years later, we finally have our first trailer to the sequel, Finding Dory. Finding Dory will be focused on the amnesiac character, Dory, and will explore the idea of her being reunited with her family. The film will take place six months after the events of Finding Nemo, and will be set off the coast of California. Mark, what do you think of this first trailer for Finding Dory? I thought this trailer was great for the purpose of reminding us that there's a movie called Finding Dory coming out that has our favorite characters from Finding Nemo back in action. Having said all that, the actual trailer didn't really do much for me. I, 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 I'm still concerned that Dory is an ancillary character, not a lead character that we have to follow. I love Ellen DeGeneres. I think she's a comedic genius on the highest level. Her as Dory was hysterical in the first Finding Nemo because she was a side character. It wasn't her story. So now we're getting her story, and this trailer didn't do much to convince me that I need to go see this movie, but it's Pixar. It's a story. It's a universe that we've loved before, so I think this movie's going to be fine. I just didn't love the trailer. I am going to echo a lot of what you just said, actually. I, I think it was a fine little announcement trailer. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll call it. Right. It's yeah. an announcement trailer. Like, a bunch of us who read the, the, the movie news and stuff like that, we knew that a Finding Dory was coming. There have been a couple little announcements, but... I think there's probably a lot of people out there. Do you know when this movie comes out? It's going to be 13 years since Finding Nemo. I mean, talking about feeling old. I mean, 13 <laughs> years. It, that feels like it was maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. But it was 13 years ago this movie came out. Um, but yeah, the movie's still like eight months away. This is the first thing they're putting out there for everybody to see. And you're right. This was a, hey guys, remember how much you love Nemo? Remember how much you love Dory? Remember how much you love these guys? I think it was more of that than anything else. We're probably another three months away or so from a legit like two minute and 20 second trailer or something like that. So at, if this was the trailer two months before the movie coming out, I'd be saying, man, they are dropping the ball. Yeah. But as a little announcement eight months out, it was cute. I think it did the job it set out to do that you so eloquently put. So, yeah, I'm, I'm into it. Yeah, I actually needed that 13 years later refresher course because I saw it once in the theater. I really loved it. But I literally have forgotten the movie so seeing a little teaser like this and getting oh yeah there's that manta and all these other like you know aquarium friends or whatever you want to call them it's like it's it's a good refresher so i'm waiting for the full trailer we talked about this this morning it's like yeah this is just a like hey check these people out. remember these characters there's a new movie you'll get a full trailer later so this was perfect tease yeah and again th th this trailer was not made to impress regionally famous movie talker mark ellis this was made <laughs> to let the world know that there is a movie coming out at some point called finding dory and it's the exciting really? sequel we got to see more footage of this on the animation day of d23 and i still ha echo some of those sentiments and i'm a little concerned that dory has too much of a prominent role because it is her story but having said all that it's i love albert brooks and i love ellen degeneres so much as comedians that i would love to see this movie you know ann and i we have uh seasonal passes to disneyland so we go to disneyland quite a bit and honestly one of my favorite parts of disneyland there's a place in the park where there's a big body of water and they got some like uh buoys on it and they've got fake animatronic seagulls from finding <laughs> nemo on it and as you walk, walk by they all yell mine 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 and i don't know why I'm an I like an idiot. I start as <laughs> I just start laughing like every time I see it. Every time I walk by them and they do that, I just start laughing my fool head off. I gotta I, go. What's the name of that place? Disney. Disney uh, place. I Disney think it's Disney place. place. I think it's Disney I'm a Bush place. Gardens kid at heart, but I gotta go to Disneyland. It's been too long. <laughs> All right. What's next? As most of you are aware, a Baywatch movie starring Dwayne the Rock Johnson and Zac Efron is currently in development that will be helmed by Horrible Bosses director Seth Gordon. Today comes news that a short list of actresses for the film has surfaced. According to a report in Deadline, one or several of these actresses could end up with various roles in the film. 
film. The actresses include Johnson's San Andreas co-star Alexandra Daddario, The Vampire Diaries' Nina Dobrev, Storm from the upcoming X-Men Apocalypse Alexandra Ship, Pretty Little Liars' Ashley Benson, Shelley Henning from Teen Wolf and Unfriended, Bianca Santos from The Duff and Ouija, and Denise Taunts from Big Time Rush. Schnapp, which if any of these actresses would you like to see in Baywatch? Well, this isn't really what I would call a short list. This is like the seven. <laughs> the seven. As opposed uh, to the hundred yeah, candidates, I seven, guess. Uh, seven beautiful ladies, all, uh, you know, obviously they're going to be in bikinis and bathing suits. And it's Baywatch. They've already got the rock. There's going to be a bunch of other, like, stud hunk dudes that they're going to be, like, trailing out on their whatever short list. So this is like the uh, the meat market version of which ladies <laughs> here uh, do you guys or gals find attractive? So I'd say all of them, you know. I had to do my <laughs> research this morning because I wasn't, wasn't familiar with a lot of them. So I found all of them incredibly stunning and beautiful, and I think they should all be in Baywatch. How's that for a lady? <laughs> Man. <laughs> Talk about the dog pound. I mean, I think in Hollywood they could have found somebody at least remotely attractive. Oh my God! I mean, that's quite the list. And you know, it's 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 you know, and it should be. We should really emphasize this too. The report that came out of Deadline was that they're not just shortlisted for one role. They're, they're, these could be several roles. Right. So we could see like three of these uh, young ladies, th four of these young ladies popped up. Um, obviously the name that jumps out to me the biggest, the best is Alexandra Daddario. Cause not just because she is like a freak of nature, she's so attractive, but she has shown us, whether it's in True Detective or other things she's, I, look, you're talking about San Andreas. The first thing you think about is not good performances. If you can have a good performance in a movie like that, she gave it. Like, so she's got talent on top of stunningly beautiful. I was telling Mark this story beforehand, but I, I, I really should share. This is how ridiculously, obscenely good looking Alexander Daddario is, all right? So everybody knows the scene from True Detective. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say that. So I wasn't really watching True Detective. I had watched the first two episodes and I didn't like the first two episodes. So I gave up on it. Now later I binge watched the rest and really enjoyed the rest, but I had given up on it. So Anne was still watching it. And guys, get the, keep in mind, this is my wife, <laughs> all right? My wife calls me one day when I'm at work and when I'm at the office, right? And she calls, she goes, John, honey, have you seen this Alexander Daddario sex scene from True Detective? I said, no, I, I'm not watching it. She goes, John, this is my wife telling me this. Stop what you're doing, get online <laughs> and find that clip. It is stupid how beautiful this girl's body is. And like, and all this, this is my wife telling me, when your wife is telling you to stop what you're doing, get online and look up some smutty porn, that <laughs> that is that says something is different about this situation. Well, John, um, this isn't smutty porn. This is an artistically <laughs> shot, amazing series called True Detective, folks. And if you haven't seen it, watch the first season. <laughs> Uh, which I, I cannot deny anything you just said, but 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 beyond that, so everybody will look at her and say, "Wow, ridiculous! This girl can act," mm -hmm. and that's the biggest thing here. Uh, Nina Dobrev, good Canadian girl, so I got to be happy about that <laughs> as well. I know uh, Ashley will probably have a bit of fondness for yes. Our Pretty Little Liars in the and house. And Nina Dobrev started on Degrassi, was mm -hmm. a terrible, terrible actress, and has come such a freaking long way than that. It's absolutely amazing. So I'm rooting for her, and of course, my girl Ashley Benson. Mm. She's looking like fire and I feel like she'd be a perfect fit for Baywatch she's like I mean I guess it kind of depends what kind of character she'd play but I really could see her in that role if you know what I mean <laughs> yeah she might be the Pam Anderson yeah you like, know yeah. Oh, what about you Mark? I'm still getting over the wife phone call like that's so great that your wife called you because when that scene happened I got a call from Harloff and Makuga like dude <laughs> You gotta see this scene. I still haven't seen the scene, so, so I'm the last guy on He Earth hasn't. We talked I'm, about that this morning. I'm like, you haven't seen the scene. You like, hear that, Mom? Nope. Your boy's doing fine in L.A. Um, first of all, how much fun did Ray have putting that crap together? <laughs> um, I'm actually I, uh, shocked at like how he actually kept it together. You know, but we don't <laughs> know that over he, the top, he went right. in the bathroom and made that for an hour, so we don't know what all went down. Oh um, yeah, gosh. I mean, Alexander Daddario you would have to think is the lead because she's the biggest name, and she also doesn't have to do Baywatch to enhance her career. She can do a lot of other things. She might have a little more options than some of these other ladies. Bianca Santos is somebody to keep an eye on, though, because she was in Ouija, and I liked Ouija more than a lot of other people did. Because One of the reasons why is because I believed her in that role. So if she can pull off Ouija, I'm sure she can pull off Baywatch. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of comedic elements to Baywatch, a lot more than we're on the classic TV show. So you have to be able to pull that off. But in order to do that, you need to commit to the role you're playing. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you need to be somewhat of a good actress in order to make those scenes funny because you got The Rock, you got Zac Efron. Right. Any one of these, I think, would be a great choice physically. But can you pull off the role of being a lifeguard and commit to it? That's what's going to make us laugh.
awesome. All right, folks. Well, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Ashley, what do we got? John Wick 2 is currently in production in New York City. And according to a report in Deadline, several new and returning cast members have been added to the action sequel. According to the report, some of the notable additions are John Leguizamo returning as Aurelio, Lance Reddick returns as Hotel Continental Manager Sharon, Bridget Monaghan returns as John Wick's deceased wife, Helen Wick, and new addition actor Peter Stormare. John, buy or sell these additions to John Wick 2. Absolutely. Buy now. I'm, I am a little bit curious. What does this mean? Like the Bridget Moyahan? Wait, wait, what? Okay, now if it's, or, or is it going to be flashbacks? If it's going to be flashbacks, that makes sense. Okay, I'm totally in. It. Is this a matter of wait? She didn't really die, and she's <laughs> back, and now she's the bad guy. I mean, I, I don't know how ridiculous Ooh. they're going to go. You know what? John Wick is just the right kind of ridiculous. If they did something like that, 99 other movies, <laughs> I say that's stupid. <laughs> a John Wick that could actually work. Um, I wanted to see more John Le Le Leguizamo in the first one. I That scene in the original John Wick, when he's talking to the mob boss on the phone, like he's in trouble, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just, it's whose car he stole. The mob, well, whose car did he steal? John Wick's. And then that pause, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that movie, if I wasn't already completely bought in that movie by that scene, I was in, so I'm really glad he's back. And Peter Stormare, mm -hmm. I, Love this guy. He's one of these guys whose name you'll never remember, but his face you'll never forget. Like you, you see him pop up in like a thousand movies. He's always the Russian bad guy or some other thing like that. And he always brings, I think, a humor to it, yet really intimidating and scary at the same time. Um, but the big one to me that really jumps out is Lance Reddick as the manager of the Hotel Continental. Whether it's in The Wire or whether it's in The Fringe or anything like that, um, I just, this guy has a presence yeah. on screen. And when he's playing the soft, you know, the, the mild mannered manager of the Continental, well, yes, Mr. Wicklow. But you just know he could probably rip off and kill seven guys just like that <laughs> right. if you really need to. So I was really excited. I'm giddy. I'm just thinking about this movie. I'm excited that it's already filming. I cannot wait to see this. I love these cast editions. So for me, it's a huge buy. Schnepp, you. Yeah, a big buy for me too. John Wick was a, a surprisingly fun film. I thought it was just going to be a kind of a run-of-the-mill action film yeah. before I saw it. Then after I saw it, I was like, wow, I would love to see a sequel to this. I hope enough people go see this movie. And now we're getting it. And honestly, what I really wanted was more of the Continental. And yes. Because that was yes. like the, the, the surprise of the movie for me was like, wow, this is a really fun little world that they created. So I want to go deeper into that world. And I think everyone involved also wanted to go deeper into that world. So we're going to see a lot more. And Stormare, you know, he's he's such a great actor. I, whenever I see his name, I think I want the pancakes. <laughs> pancakes. And he's like the chilling role that he did in Fargo. It'll never escape me. It doesn't matter what role he plays. And I think, you know, he's a great character actor. So I'd love to see him really like you know, push it to the limit in this film. So I full buy for me. Yeah, right. and John Leguizamo is terrific too. Let's not forget about him and what a chameleon that guy can yeah. be on screen. So him in anything is a win. Uh, Bridget Moynihan coming back as the deceased wife. W you would think it would be a flashback, but Ooh, you're, you're but right. With John Wick, who knows? She's you a twin. No, it's his. She's, it's her, it's, <laughs> it's his just, wife's twin. You could have so much fun with that with that plot point of him remembering something, or maybe that's why that that sets off the story in motion that we're going to get in John Wick too. But I echo y'all's sentiments: is that the best news in this? is not a casting news it's that they casted the hotel back in yes. John Wick too because yeah. I love seeing the Continental and we already know Ian McShane we already know Ian McShane's coming back right, right, so right, right. That, that really emphasizes that yeah so I'm just I'm, I'm so excited to see this movie and uh, and again it was one of the fun surprises of last year and I think this one will be not a surprise but I think this one might double what the first one did at the box office oh it apps I have no doubt because I mean the first one didn't actually do all that well at the box office look they put out the first trailer for it about three and a half weeks before mm -hmm. the movie came out and let's be honest I, look I'm going to confess it right here. I was one of those guys who was like, yeah, Keanu Reeves is in it. And I, I had just seen a number of his films that had disappointed me and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But give credit where credit mm -hmm. is due. Like we talk about how good and fun the movie is. A, one of the big reasons that movie was so good is because of what Keanu Reeves brought to that movie, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was great as John Wick. And I just, I cannot wait to see him back in this role. That's right. I, I just hope nothing happens to a dog in this one. Oh, can't, my God. Can't well, handle it again. That was part of the, like, the, the fun of the trailer and then the movie itself was just those scenes where they're like, 
What do you mean he's back? Yeah. They just built that the man with no name, that person the who's mythology like the mythology. Yeah. yeah, so they built it up just in the trailer that made you want to see the movies. All right, I'll check it out. Seems like it could be cheesy. There's elements that are cheesy, but it's so much fun. And the violence quota, the dome shots, like that's I think you're gonna see double dome shots. Right, movies, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, going back to the dog, and I, I think I might have mentioned this on the show before, but it's so this is this is where the movie really shines because a lot of these action movies, and if you just look at it on paper. The original John Wick, is, it's a little formulaic. I mean, yeah. we've seen this before. A guy who was once this has to now come back into action. Okay, but what they did was they did it with a little dog that they forced us to fall in love with. <laughs> that puppy... And then when they killed that puppy, see, if they had dragged out of bed and killed his wife and daughter in an action thing, or what we would have been, oh yeah, man, that's not cool. We'd have been, that's not cool. When they killed that dog, when they killed that dog, all of us, you, me, the people in the theater, Ashley, Des, all of us, them, them fuckers gotta die. That's right. They gotta die. They're going down. <laughs> like, yeah. And so they got us emotionally invested in what should have been just a cheesy, campy action flick. Instead, they got us emotionally hooked in that me movie immediately. It was such a brilliant, like I get, you could say the dog was a MacGuffin really. And right. like, and in one of the best uses of a MacGuffin of all time, it's just, I'm getting excited thinking about it. I gotta stop, I'm sorry. Well, what, what if he has like a bunch of cats in John Wick 2 and they oh, kill him and then, no! and then he's just like, ah, whatever. Oh. Yeah. He's just like, he's like yeah, yeah, I'll miss the cats, but I'm not gonna kill anybody. <laughs> that would okay. be horrible. I, honestly, that's true, like a lot of the, People joke like never kill the dog. Never. That's like the, they've made a movie about the guy who like made a film and then in the end the dog gets killed. Mm -hmm. There was an actual meta film about that. And then this movie comes along is like no, we kill the dog, but we had the perfect the perfect reason. Revenge. The yeah. whole movie is all about revenge. I just so. can't believe how emotionally invested I got in that movie when they killed a dog. Uh, anyway, all right. <laughs> What's next? In a recent interview with our own Collider.com, Batman vs. Superman producer Charles Roven sat down with us to talk about several projects. When it was mentioned that we'd love to see a four-hour cut of the new DC movie, Roven said the following, I don't know if you'll ever get the four-hour version, but there may be something that's coming along that might be slightly less long than that. Mark Byersell that these comments suggest that we're going to get a three-plus-hour director's cut of Batman vs. Superman when the film comes out on home video. Huge buy for me. This is one of the comments is going to get me to go buy a PS4 or something I can play <laughs> Blu-rays on because I am really going to want that Batman v Superman Blu-ray. I cannot wait to see this film, and once I see it, I'm going to want to know more about what was in the film, what's not in the film, and what they left out that you can see on a Blu-ray or some sort of DVD extra. I cannot wait to see this, and I think it's true. I think I four hours is a long time but if you get three plus hours of footage it would be something fun for the true fans to sit down and watch all that and go through scenes because the great thing about watching a blu-ray cut that's longer than something in theatrical is that you can actually watch the scenes and judge like oh yeah i realize why they didn't leave that in there oh that would have been cool but you can still appreciate the original film and it just adds to the fun for me you know what's funny uh, quite often watching these extended cuts make me appreciate what editors do because i'll be honest with you seven times out of ten the real theatrical cut is a much better movie than the extended mm -hmm. edition. That's why editors are so important. But every once in a while, like the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, they put a lot of stuff in there. It's like, hey man, that stuff could have been kept in. But I think what you were pointing out is something I completely agree with. Even if it's, I watched the, a three and a half hour extended cut of Batman v Superman, and it's clearly not as good as the theatrical cut, it would make me appreciate, oh, I could see why they cut that out. And you start to get an understanding of the filmmaking process when you see what they didn't use. Right. And that's a really cool thing. Or, or who knows, maybe it'll be fan, like even better than the theatrical cut. I buy the fact that he's talking about a director's cut. I don't think he's talking about, I, I really don't buy into the theory that's floating around that he's talking about a, a second theatrical cut, an extended theatrical cut that plays alongside of a regular... I don't buy... There's a little bit of a theory of that going wrong right, huh. right now. I reject that notion. I do think he's talking about a Blu-ray DVD. And, and by the way, full shout out to uh, to our, uh, our dot .com side, Collider.com, for getting that little uh, nugget mm -hmm. out of Roven. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, Schnepp, how do you see this? Well, I almost called him Christian. <laughs> hey, Christian. What's going on? Um, I wish I could do that Scooby-Doo. It's really me, Harlow. A Mission Impossible. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to invest in a rubber mask for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, 
I think uh, Zack Snyder is the one of the kings of making an extended cut. Like, if you see Watchmen, then you see his director's cut, and then you see, like, <clears throat> I can't remember what it was called, the ultimate cut, the shipwreck cut, or whatever, the four-hour cut, which has got everything in the cartoon and everything in there. They're all extremely watchable, and none of the segments in, in at least his versions of that he made for Watchmen are, oh, I see why they took that out. The only time I felt that, I was like, oh, I see why they took that out for the theatrical run, but I never thought about it while I was watching it because it's like to make a four hour movie is like you said, you need an intermission or you just it just is a harder thing to sit through for one entire thing. Like when you're at home, you could take a break, you could pause it. So I think you can go pee yeah, you is the bottom pee. line here yeah. is it's hard to hold in pee for three and a half hours a in a theater thing. and you don't want to leave something. the theater you're because then it. you're going to miss something. But this is one of the ways that you can add to the movie without tainting it. Yeah. You know, it's amazing that you can actually do that. You can watch a scene like it always goes back to Star Wars with me, but you can go on YouTube and watch like the Return of the Jedi deleted scene. Right. And there's one really cool scene with Luke building his lightsaber. Right. And I'm like, that is awesome. And I'm glad it's not in the movie. Right. It just makes yeah. sense for that to not yeah. be in the movie. Yeah. The one of the very few exceptions is Die Hard with a Vengeance. The the, the alternate end of Die Hard with a Vengeance is really cool. Watch it on YouTube. And it's one of those ones where I'm like, maybe they should have put I agree. that one that was, in there. I think that ending I'm, I'm is like better. this. I can't, I can't tell for sure, but it is awesome. What I would say about the difference between theatrical cuts and, and home video cuts is sometimes you, the, you win both ways. You see the theatrical version, and then let's take Robert Rodriguez's Sin City, where they p basically recut the entire film and took all those intersected um, sequences and made them standalone, like one hour, right, short, right? Like not shorts, one hour films, and so you could see Marv's film, you could see you know all three different films, but as standalones. And I love that experience that I could watch that at home anytime mm. I want, and it's a great thing. Or I'll watch the entire film the way it was meant to be seen in the theater. So for something like this, I'm sure it'll be a maybe a two hour, two and a half hour film, but there's going to be an hour of additional scenes that just like built up characters and stuff. There's always that through line and then there's those side characters and their stories always get diminished. It always happens in, all, in almost all scripts and in big budget ones it happens more. So I'm sure nothing was written to be like, oh, that'll be a deleted scene. It just becomes a deleted scene once they're like, the focus is here, we're going this way. So A I great example wait. of that is what happened with the most recent X-Men Days of Future totally, Past, right? Totally. Because, you know, and I, by the way, I've still not seen the road cut. Everybody's telling me the road cut's great, but a great example of what Schnepp is just talking about, X-Men Days of Future Past, he had all the, he had this big scene with a Rogue in it and another additional scene with Rogue mm -hmm. in it, and he just sat back in the end and said, doesn't work for the movie. I think the movie streamlines better if we cut it out. So he cut it out and then put out the Rogue edition where they put it back in, so that's, so how it's, I gotta see Batman versus Superman first to right. know how much I'd be looking forward to an extended <laughs> right. cut. Cause if the movie's fantastic for Redux, Ooh. then I don't care about an extended <laughs> edition, but I'm holding out hope that that movie's gonna be awesome. All right, folks, it is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to start talking about what is opening this week, brought to you by our good friends over at AMC Theaters. Three movies opening in wide release this week. We're gonna talk about one of them today. So Ashley, what do we have? One of the films opening in wide release this week is The True Life Story of the 33. Disaster strikes on August 5th, 2010, as a copper and gold mine collapses in Chile, trapping 33 men underground. With more than 2,000 feet of rock in their way, members of a rescue team work tirelessly for 69 days to save the seemingly doomed crew. Beneath the rubble, the miners begin an epic quest to survive contending with suffocating, suffocating heat and the need for food and water. With family, friends, and the rest of the world watching it becomes a race against time and a true test of the human spirit schnepp are you looking forward to the 33 most definitely i think this is a, a film about the human spirit and like not giving up and perseverance it's all those things like the above ground crew not giving up on the people who are trapped underneath the people trapped underneath trying desperately to survive and hold on for as long as possible not believing that the people upstairs are going to give up on them so i can't wait to see it i remember when it was happening when reading upon it in the news like they're trying to get these guys out and you know you're like oh it sounds like it's a lot of mining disasters are horrifying disasters people die a lot of this the 33 guys survived it's amazing so and the cast everybody everything about it i'm really looking forward to seeing the 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 story behind you know the 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 news story you know this, I'm, I'm absolutely looking forward to this movie. And this is one of those rare news stories where for a couple of days, everybody was glued to their TV, seeing what was going on. It's just one of those stories. And you're right. When you, when you really hear about it, trapped underground, 2,000 feet underground for 33 days, fiction. Sounds like total <laughs> right. fiction. 
This was real. This was real events. And so I'd seen their, their, uh, their rendition of this and their incarnation of the story has got me very, very curious. I'm very much looking forward to seeing this movie. What about you, Mark? Oh, yeah, I, I can't wait to see it. I I'm, I'm, have the pleasure of seeing it tomorrow night. And it's one of those stories that I remember when it was going on and you hear, oh, they're still trapped. They're still trapped, but they're still alive, too. And it's, it's the key is not giving up hope. And so many times when you see a movie, it's one set of humans or one human being versus another set of humans or one human being. And here, everybody's on the same team here. You have the below ground and above ground. Every Everybody pulling together their efforts to do the same task. And so something like that on film, I think, is going to play out really well, and it's going to be a special flick. All right, folks. Well, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email it to us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, we are doing this show live right now, and there are thousands of you watching us live at this very moment. For those of you who are watching us live, at the end of the show, we're going to leave some time to take some of your live Twitter questions. How do you get a Twitter question on our show? Simple. Hop on Twitter, make sure you're following us at Collider Video, and tweet in your question to at Collider Video. That simple. Ashley will pick out some questions near the end, but for now, we're going to get to the mailbag questions. So, Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Omar Westmass writes, Hey guys, been watching the show since the OG days back at AMC. What are your thoughts on Activision and Blizzard making a studio together and their plans on making a Skylander series, a Diablo movie? Movie and possibly a Call of Duty cinematic universe. Yeah, I thought this was very interesting. This is the new thing. A lot of these companies now creating their own movie division. That's that's kind mm. of the trend right now. Right. Stay tuned for Collider Video creating its own movie division here. <laughs> um, uh, the Skylander <laughs> series seems to make sense. From what I hear, that's going to probably be an animated series. Probably. Uh, Call of Duty, yeah, they're talking about Call of Duty almost having their own big shared cinematic universe. Not necessarily a lot of interconnected stories, but movies that do happen in the same reality mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. That could be interesting to see what they do there. You mentioned a Diablo movie in your question. I have not heard of a Diablo movie. Um, I don't think they announced that as part of their plans. I could be wrong about that, um, but I have not heard that. It would make sense. I mean, if you unless, unless Activision Blizzard already optioned the rights to a Diablo, because remember, they have, Activision Blizzard has nothing to do with the Warcraft movie coming out. Mm. They might have already optioned out the rights to Diablo, which I wouldn't be surprised if some studio wanted to secure those rights a long time ago. That being said, maybe it's a part of it, I just haven't heard of it. It sounds like an interesting move. Look, if Marvel can create their own movie production division, why not a, an Activision Blizzard? They make some of the most immersive, I cannot tell you how many hours of my life have spent in intimate romantic moments with StarCraft and Warcraft and Diablo. Mm. <laughs> so it's just like, I'm immersed in those stories. Millions of us are immersed in those stories. It would kind of make sense that they would try and take that step. I just hope that the people over there don't think, oh, how hard can it be to make a movie? Let's make a movie. No, no, when you start your studio, first priority, biggest priority, Go out and get the best people in the world that have authority over you because they are the ones to know how to make movies, not you. Oh, we made a great cutscene in that video game. We can make movies. I hope they're they're smart enough to not be that stupid. Uh, and this could work out really well. So I think it's fascinating. What have you heard about this, Mark? And what do you think about the whole movie? I am very excited about this. I remember getting inklings of this that, that have been trickling in the last couple of months. And when you hear that this is kind of official, it means that they're treating this material with respect, which is what we've always been begging for as fans of video games, and we want to see them converted to good films. We've always said on this show that video game movies could be the next comic book movies, where you treat that with such respect that it ends up being great on film. The fact that there's a studio that, that's, that's going to be housing these kind of movies now is such great news for all the fans out there. When I look at these particular movies, the Skylander one I'm not really interested in, but right. Diablo sounds like a great story. That sounds like, and the, the Call of Duty cinematic universe? Are you yeah. kidding me? That is a no-brainer. That sounds, that you could have all, anybody who's good at war in a video game could be in the Call of Duty. You could get the Ghost Recon boys. You could get Sam Hunter from Splinter Cell in right. there. I would love to see a Call of Duty shared universe. Yeah, I'm still waiting for that Splinter Cell uh, thing. But uh, the people who work <laughs> at Blizzard, I know a couple of them, they're a dedicated company, and they and I'm really happy to see this merger with Activision. I think, I mean, to me, I'd I'd love to see Pitfall the movie. You know what I mean? This is an oh, old yeah. Activision game. You just add a little romancing the stone, and flavor it up a little. It could be a really fun film. They have Activision has a great catalog of video games that could be turned into a lot of really cool films. And obviously, Blizzard has so many. And and does do you guys know if Blizzard has StarCraft? I have? see. I don't know. No, you know what? I believe we might have done a story like two or three years ago about somebody getting the option hmm. rights on StarCraft because that's a movie you got to make. That's a movie because I, I wonder, it's like this whole merger and like, hey, let's do it. 
is sort of almost a reaction to all these other movies being made on their games like Warcraft. That's Blizzard's bread and butter, you know? So they're sort of like, let, let's let get our stuff together and make our own movies. I think it's a really smart call and I, I'd love to see what they've got on the slate once they announce it. And Activision has so improved everything about that company since I was a kid and they were cranking out like totally. really bad video games for a long time. Remember the Ghostbusters game on Nintendo? Oh. It was atrocious. <laughs> and now with, with you know, the, the resurgence partially due to Guitar Hero, but yeah. a lot of other things, a lot of different corporate shakeups. Activision is crushing it right now. This is awesome news. Yeah. This side note on StarCraft, I, I had a lot of success with Protoss Carrier Rush, everybody. Just try utilizing a Protoss carrier rush a little bit. You might be surprised how good your results are. All right, what's next? Conal Wood writes, now that all the major spy films have been released this year, how would you rank Kingsman, Spy, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, Man from Uncle, and Spectre? Thank you very much. Great. Yeah. Dare I say the best year for spy movies Ooh. ever. So good. There's mm -hmm. not a film on here I actively dislike. Wait a minute. They didn't mention Spy with Melissa McCarthy. No, no, it's McCarthy. in there. No, it's in there. Oh, yep. did they? Yeah. Right, missed it. It's Sorry. stuck in there it like did. a spy. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> missed it. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah. So I... Um, I don't think there's one in here that I wholeheartedly dislike. Uh, I will say this. Okay, so coming in bottom for me, uh, how many are there? One, two, three, I think four, got your five. Six. There are five. five six? Yeah. Six. There are six. So coming in number six for me will be Spectre. Uh, that's the one I liked. Uh, I liked the least. Uh, coming in at number five for me will be Spy. Coming in at number four for me will be. Um, Man from Uncle. Okay. Man from Uncle will be number four for me. Uh, number three will be. Oh, wait. Are there only five? One, two, three. There are five. There are only five. I'm sorry. So uh, coming in, number two for me will be Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. And number one for me is going to be King, uh, Kingsman. I have flip flopped on this all morning mm. between Mission Impossible Rogue Nation and Kingsman. I think I'm going to have Kingsman. I, I had a little bit more entertainment value overall with Kingsman, but I will not argue anybody who tells me they want to put Mission Impossible Rogue Nation ahead of Kingsman. So I'm going to go Kingsman, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, Man from Uncle, Spy, and Spectre. That's my five. Mark, what about you? I've been thinking about this a long time, John, and I'm ready to reveal my list of the best five. <laughs> movies of the year. Number one is Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, no doubt about it, with a close number two being Kingsman. Now at number three, I think I'm going to have to go Spectre by default. I'm going to put Spy at number four, which I did really enjoy, and Man from Uncle for me is going to be at the bottom, number five. It had a lot of potential. didn't live up to all of it, but I still had fun watching the movie. Well, guys, I have to I have put a lot of thought about 25 seconds into this answer. <laughs> um, Rogue Nation. Beyond a doubt, it killed all the other. The, all the all the rest of the spy movies are far, far, far behind Rogue Nation. As far as for my uh, entertainment that I had from seeing that film from start to finish, I could not believe how how much I enjoyed th the fifth Mission Impossible. That it beat the fourth <laughs> Mission Impossible, which I absolutely mm -hmm. loved. That this fifth one was more entertaining and more exciting, and and just I didn't know what was going to happen next. So as far as for a spy movie, that's number one. Number two is definitely Kingsman. That was like, I loved it. It was fantastic. I'm so happy that a second one is coming out. That was the surprise spy movie for me. Number three is Spy, the comedy movie with Melissa McCarthy, because uh, I found it really enjoyable. And it was like her character kind of like, I didn't know who she was for a little while if, until she started just cracking jokes. I was like, all right, the rest of the movie doesn't even matter as long as Melissa McCarthy's funny. And that's what I got. So it was a really fun comedic view of spy movies. Number four was The Man from Uncle. Overall, a disappointment, but there were a couple of amazing sequences, like that one scene when Henry Cavill's just drinking the wine and his truck. Oh, God, I love that scene. The, everything else, all the mu just the music takes over, and he's just enjoying this one crazy, solitary moment. I wish there were more moments like that in The Man from Uncle, and I wish they just called it Uncle, because no one knows what the hell The Man from Uncle, no one remembers that series. So, finally, Spectre, big disappointment for me. Bottom of the list. I think it's the last one for Daniel Craig. Uh, granted, there was a great, you know, from Russia with Love train fight sequence mm -hmm. with Batista. That was like the highlight of the movie for me. The rest of it could have fallen asleep. Now, I should point out there are a few people on the chat board throwing in their bridge of spies. Now, and maybe it's it's me. Although the, the word spies is in the title and there are characters in the movie that are spies, for, for whatever when I watch, I don't, I don't actually consider Bridge of Spies a spy movie. 
per se. Yeah. Even though, I mean, you can make an argument that, that it is. <clears throat> if I was going right. to throw that, that, that in there, I'd, I'd probably have it just below Spectre and just above Spy, because I really did like that movie. But, you know, it, it is called Prince of Spies, so, you know, Spies. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck it in there, why We're not? Talking Spies. Yeah. All right, what's next? I'm sorry, are we not going to mention this graphic? <laughs> it's oh my amazing. god, I didn't even notice uh, the graphic. And you guys were like having this serious <laughs> conversation, this adorable <laughs> dog is behind you. I didn't even. How, and speaking of dogs being great right. MacGuffins in movies, yes. I mean, that was Don't a let that dog anywhere near the set of John Wick, too. I want <laughs> that dog. We do not want to see that happen. <laughs> Right, what's right. next? Rodrigo Gonzalez writes, Hey, Collider, big fan from Chile. I watch the shows every day. I love Star Wars to death. I've been watching them with my family since I was four in 97. Recently, John said the prequels couldn't be remade because they're canon. Then why not just make them uncanon or something? Is Star Wars canon really so sacred? Is there a law or something? Because I feel like I can't see the big deal here. Thanks, and may the force be with you. Yeah, somebody brought up, we could actually, I get asked this question a lot, but I don't know if I had, I had ever addressed it. So on this weekend on mailbag i took a question and said hey what what if disney reboots reboots just the prequels and i said look the prequels are like that heroin addicted unemployed drunk 47 year old uncle who still lives in your grandmother's basement he's an embarrassment but he's still family <laughs> um and as in the prequels are still family that's that's the thing that people like me just have to shut up and accept it's still family. It's in my grandmother's basement. It's still shooting heroin. It's still an embarrassment to the family, but it is family and it is canon. And there's, there's meaning to the word canon. Now, when they proclaim the prequels, all the movies, that includes the prequels, when they proclaim that they are canon, that is them saying this is forever and always. That by calling them canon doesn't just say these movies in and of themselves are now venerated, if you will for all time, but it also means that all the movies that come after are building upon what is in those movies. You cannot now simply go back and redact saying that they're canon when all the movies you're now making moving forward, all the new cartoon shows you're making, all stuff, rely on things that are in those movies as factual and unmovable. They are canon. To call something canon kind of means you can't just go back and say, nah, no, it's not canon. Um, so while Look, while it would be my favorite day that Lucasfilm came out and said, we've changed our mind about the prequels, forget they exist, it's not going to happen. They are canon. They are now part of the official history of Star Wars. All the stories moving forward are built upon them. And, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to say this. They shouldn't be touched. They are what they are, and they shouldn't be touched. They have their place in the family. They have their place in history. They are what they are. They should not be touched. They will not be touched. Mark, I'm just curious if, if you got a, what your point of view on Well, you know, John, as the 47-year-old uncle who's addicted to heroin <laughs> living in a grandma's basement, um, I, I do agree with you. you. You should not touch them if for no other reason to honor the legacy of George Lucas. That was his vision, and whatever you want to say about George Lucas, he's the reason why we get to talk about Star Wars 30 years later and why we're so excited about The Force Awakens. Without him creating Star Wars from scratch, we don't get to talk about any of this and have all this fun debating all things Star Wars. So you cannot change what that man did. If you like it, if you hate it, I'm not a huge fan of the prequels, and I agree with you. I think that they're like that one cousin that you invite to Family Feud because you can't get anybody else in there and you don't agree with their answers, <laughs> but they are family. And look, you could even maybe argue that if Lucasfilm reissued them and cut some scenes out that maybe didn't make sense. I don't know that people would really want to see that. Like, I'm kind of done with a lot of that time period in Star Wars lore because it did seem like a lot of political bickering back and forth and trade federations. I don't really care about that. The Clone Wars was something I always thought I wanted to see when I was a kid because Ben Kenobi was talking about this mm -hmm. legend. And now that I got to see George Lucas's version of it, I'm like, all right, cool. I'm done. Let's move on to another story. Guys, I'm a big fan of rehabilitation. <laughs> <laughs> and I think... You both might be in a little bit of denial. So my, my perspective on it is, yes, George Lucas is the godfather of Star Wars. He created Star Wars. He hired two other people to help execute Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Uh, he bought ILM and made sure that he was the grandfather of all of our digital technology, the computers that we use, in all nonlinear digital editing, sound systems. We all rely on that because of George Lucas. With that, I'll say this. One, two, and three should be remade. Now, what I think should happen is the story structure, the spine of it, can remain the same. They should hire a team of writers and an amazing set of new directors 
and just remake episodes one, two, and three so that they're still canon, but that they're not garbage and unwatchable. So that's the problem that I have is they're so wooden and badly put together that all the special effects can't save it. Darth Maul, just because he looks cool, he says two things and he's got a tone poem and he gets cut in half. It's like... Spoiler. Spoiler, guys. Sorry. Um, they, they, they killed Darth Maul's dog. That's why he was so pissed <laughs> and off. And wait a minute. So Darth yeah. Maul's still alive if you're going by like the Clone Wars and he's got the robot legs. At least he and stuff. was. Right. Or, yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying I, I don't see a problem because we're always talking about movies getting rebooted. You're a big proponent of that. I am, that. actually, yeah. I'm going to say I'm a big proponent of Star Wars, the prequels, getting rebooted, and they deserve it because all the Star Wars fans like myself who love the four, five, and six and hated one, two, and three and can't wait for seven, I think we deserve a great one, two, and three. If it's going to be canon, do it right. But let me ask you this. If you're going to a movie theater to see a Star Wars movie, would you want to see something that you're already that familiar with, that you already experienced? Do you want to see a movie where Darth Vader is a kid again or even a teenager? Or would you rather see something completely new and different like what we're going to get with The Force Awakens or any of those other stories that are in the anthology films? I personally would rather see something new and different as opposed to just retreading what we already had, which I don't think should be remade in the first place. I, I, I'm not arguing that fact, but I'm, I'm saying update them remake them you know what i hate you know what i hate more than anything else on this show i hate it when you or freaking harloff who's sitting back there i hate it when one of you two ass clowns put me in a position where i'm the freaking one defending the prequels i hate that i hate that so much but i'm the one defending the prequels okay um with all that being said, guys, I said we were going to take your quest, some of your questions live via Twitter, and we are going to do that right now. Send in your tweets to at Collider Video. But before we get to those tweets, and you can start sending them in now, um, Ashley's over there keeping her eye on it. We'd be really remiss um, if we didn't mention this. You'll remember um, on Jedi Council this past week, uh, Christian and David and I uh, talked a bit about the situation with Daniel Fleetwood, uh, the Star Wars fan, husband um, with a very rare form of cancer. Uh, who was dying, he was not going to make it to the uh, premiere of uh, Star Wars Episode Seven, And an online campaign began to, uh, I believe it was Force for Daniel was yeah. the hashtag, mm -hmm. to try to get him the ability to see Star Wars Force Awakens before it's too late. Um, you guys did it. He did get three, I think it was three days ago, he yep. saw the film. Uh, I can't remember if he got to see it with his wife or not. I hope he did. Uh, he saw the film, uh, I, and the news came out this morning that uh, in his sleep, Daniel had passed away. His wife put it, put it up on Facebook. Um, Daniel, ha Daniel, who did get to see Star Wars, has passed away. It's a sad story. Um, but at the same time, um, I mean, I don't know this dude. I'm getting emotional. Um, there, a great movie once said, every man dies, but not every man lives. <laughs> um, and... In the case of Daniel Fleetwood, in the in the face of the most horrific thing, obviously he or his wife, and we, we shouldn't forget his wife in all this, mm -hmm. um, would, would ever face in his life the most incredible challenge, the most incredible difficulty, the most incredible trial. In a world where on the online universe is populated by trolls and assholes and, and people who just like to be jackasses and make things difficult, it can often make us lose faith in who we are as a, uh, as a people, as a species even. But the situation of Daniel Fleetwood was one that reminded us that we can all win. Um, we saw the online world, the fan community, rally around a guy that we have never met, that we don't know, that has nothing to do with us in the world. Yet millions of people took it upon themselves to get online and advocate and push and fight for and, and give voice to this dream of this guy who was facing his final days to bring him a moment of unparalleled joy that is something that kind of only movies can bring, to give him that moment before the end would come. And together, we won. Us at this table, you, Disney, um, Daniel's wife, and Daniel himself, all together, we won. Never underestimate joy. Never underestimate the value of bringing, even if it's just a moment, of joy into somebody's life. Daniel has passed away, and that is an incredibly sad thing. But 
in the midst of all that, there is incredible joy. That Daniel got to do something that he probably dreamed about as a Star Wars fan his whole life. That probably all of us, we joke on this show about, you know, if JJ gives you a call and wants you to come over to his house, yeah. we joke about it all the time. Daniel, as a lifelong Star Wars fan, got to embrace that, be with it. His wife got the joy of seeing his, her husband being able to do that and be a part of it. And a lot of us, including me, and I wanna thank everybody out there for this, you've given a lot of us joy to see that the online world and the online fan community isn't just a bunch of trolls and assholes and people who are out there just trying to stir shit, but we're a group and collective of people who actually care about each other, even when they're people they didn't know. And collectively, we made something amazing happen for this guy, Daniel Fleetwood. And I just wanted to say, obviously our condolences to Daniel's wife um, and in the midst of this incredible tragedy and sorrow and my deepest thanks just as a human being to everybody else who made something like this happen for this guy um, in the final days of his life. So um, rest in peace, Daniel Fleetwood and our thoughts and prayers to your wife. Did you guys want to add anything before we moved on to, to Twitter? No, I mean, I mean, beautifully said, I mean, following that story and then seeing that he got the chance to see the movie and died in his sleep fantastic yeah and it's also it's, it's one of those things where the story of daniel fleetwood reminds everybody how important star wars is to so many people so anytime some dolt on fox news wants to talk about why star wars is being oversaturated in the market or oh i'm sick of seeing star wars just remember how good star wars is and how much good it does for human beings how it makes us feel like we can become something more than ourselves it's so much safer than religion or anything else that you want to throw at it when you watch star wars you feel special you feel a magic and i'm glad that daniel fleetwood got to feel that for a little bit longer all right, so once again, thank you to all of you, and, and, um, and yeah. All right, now with that uh, put aside for now, it is time to get to the point that I said, promise you we would have, which is taking some of your live Twitter questions. So Ashley, what have you picked out for us? Robert Meadows writes, will Andy Serkis ever win an Oscar? Oh man, that is, it's... <sighs> That's the discussion that comes up every time one of his movies <laughs> right. come. Like I, you know, at this table we have some differences of opinion, which is understandable. We are this is untreaded upon territory. Andy Serkis is kind of breaking new ground and raising questions for us as film fans that we've never really faced before. We've never considered a motion capture person for an Oscar until Andy Serkis started doing it. Right. I do believe it ain't gonna happen this year. It ain't gonna happen the next year. I do believe Andy Serkis is going to get at least a nomination. I'll go so far as to say, I believe within the next five years, maybe 10, Andy Serkis will get a nomination because he is so consistent in what he brings. And I think what he brings, more and more people are recognizing it. Um, so I think within the next five years, I think it's going to happen. Schnepp, do you think it's going to happen? I think in a, they're going to have to create a subcategory for it. That's a possibility. And I think that's fair. I mean, there's, there's categories for best actor, best supporting actor, are there categories for best voiceover? There should be a category for best motion capture because that's that's where we're headed. And we're headed there with not only just movies, but with virtual reality and all the different kinds of all encompassing, uh, you know, kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sh shows and events that we're going to be seeing in the future. Uh, I think Andy Serkis is an incredible actor just as an actor alone, not an enhanced motion capture actor. I think he's a great actor. So I think at some point, in the near future, you're going to see him not just being a great actor, but being nominated for it. Well, we already know Leo's winning this year for The Revenant, but I think the best supporting actor could go to Snow, baby. If not this year, it could look, it could happen, okay? The Force Awakens could be awesome, and it could get nominated for a lot of Oscars. Having said that, I think he's definitely going to win an Oscar at some point for something. I would, I would assume it would be best supporting actor, but even if it's not that, even if they do something with performance capture, where even if, you know how they host the Oscars, but then at a certain point during the ceremony, they cut away to two weeks ago right. at the Science of Demigod yes, Awards, hosted yeah. by like Alan Thicke or somebody, we gave away a lot. <laughs> Everybody loves the Sieber family. That's right. He might win one of those, if nothing else. So yes, Andy Serkis will definitely have some hardware from the Oscars on his mantle at some point. Yeah. All right, what's next? Matt Calixti writes, what are the jobs of a producer, executive producer, and an associate producer in a film? Are they the same job? No, they're not the same job, but they're also very fluid in that, look, uh, whatever, some, somewhere there's a written description of what they are. And then three doors down from that is a totally different written description. Right. Um, I think actually in the last couple of years, I think those descriptions have started to become a little bit more, I think people are starting to adapt a little bit of standard, but really mm -hmm. producer is one of those titles on something that from my perspective, I, I'd love to hear what you guys think is that 
that a producer could be somebody that worked works day in day out on pulling that film together getting everything that is needed tirelessly putting in the hours and blah blah, blah getting the right director working with that all a producer could be Hey, uh, I'm the one who gave you the phone number to the star of the movie. Yeah, list me as a producer. I, I mean, it's so it's a wildly fluctuating thing. Schnepp, you've worked within the business a lot. You, how would you define that to people? Well, uh, you listed off a bunch of them. Executive producer is within the television realm is usually someone who is a creator of the show. They also get that title of executive producer because they're overseeing it overseeing the entire thing, the, the full tapestry. Uh, in movies, it could be the executive producer is the money guy or the money company or somebody who who like helped get people to get the money or things like that. Uh, producer, like if you watch The Simpsons, there's 5,000 producers on that title <laughs> yeah. sequence and they all do different things. I'm the one person's in, the producer who's in charge of getting all the, vo wrangling the voiceover talent and they work with the talent coordinator, the casting director. So there's like a director and a producer, an executive producer, co-producer, co-executive producer. The one that gets the most laughs is usually the associate producer or the ass prod because people are like, those are <laughs> <laughs> those are gimmies, or those are also people who helped in certain ways, but didn't actually work completely on the production, so they get the associate producer credit. But the, you know, I would never say anyone who gets a any kind of a producerial credit is a giveaway. It's usually they helped or did something to help them move the production along. So anybody who has a producerial credit, they did something, even if they were like, look, I gave you the phone number to the guy who got you the five million, you get a producer credit, because it wouldn't have helped, it wouldn't have happened without that person. So it's all part of the pie. Yeah, I mean, everything I know about producing, I learned from Project Greenlight, so here we go. <laughs> is that producers are the most hands-on, then associate producers can work with producers. Executive producers are the most, it, you don't really know how to define it, because sometimes they are very hands on other time it's just Steven Spielberg calling Michael Bay and being like maybe not so many shots of Bud Light like maybe so not so many cans <laughs> of Bud right. Light in the Transformers movie because he is you see the executive producer title and usually like if it's like oh that guy executive produced that it doesn't necessarily mean they had anything to do with the movie but they helped in some way you know here's a, you brought up Steven Spielberg and Steven Spielberg who I think is the greatest filmmaker of all time but Steven Spielberg has produced uh, cast checks for so many movies that he, like, I remember hearing J.J. Abrams telling the story. So, uh, Steven Spielberg was an executive producer on uh, Super 8, uh, the J.J. Abrams. But the way J.J. tells the story, he had one meeting with J.J. Abrams. Where he said, oh, why don't you combine uh, that with that and see how that goes? And he's executive producer. I mean, so it really is such a fluid thing. It's awesome yeah. to see a guy like that, though, have the title of executive producer and not put his nose into everything. So, I mean, even though it's Steven Spielberg, we love the way the guy makes movies. But like Colin Trevorrow was talking about how Steven Spielberg let them take care. Right. Even though he was an executive producer on Lost World, he Lost World? It's Jurassic, Jurassic World. World. Yeah. That's the good one. And th th he let them take care of the script and mold the story themselves. So it's pretty cool. All right, what's next? Loverboy writes, should there be a <laughs> statue of limitations on reboots? Say Loverboy again. Loverboy. <laughs> nope. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Yeah, Phantom Menace should be remade. Just kind of <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Uh, he also asked Pizza or Calzone, and I'm just really curious. Pizza or Calzone? Um, you know what? Years <laughs> ago, I was really a Calzone guy, but I, I think I've gone to just, I like me my traditional pizza. Yeah. I really do. Why is that even a, yeah. why? It's always it pizza. Uh, the it's answer is pizza. Pizza. Oh, okay. well, calzone unless, decides. Unless it's the low-cal Calzone zone. What, Never. I would, a, if any of you get that reference, it's good it. for you. I would right. have a hot pocket over a calzone, all right? Whoever thinks oh, a calzone no. Calzone's no. is better Calzone's than are good. Come Calzone's down off your ivory good. tower and eat with the rest of us plebes. <laughs> Enjoy pizza. Ellis, hang on a second. What about pizza, 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 calzone, pizza, pizza, pizza? Oh, uh, like you just, missed one in there. You right, missed I'm one note. Throw a calzone in there occasionally. A strong right, bully, maybe. What's next? Jason Smith writes, what fictional world from a film would you like to exist in? Ooh, that's a good one. See, there are a lot of worlds that I love on film, but I don't want to live there because I'd die. <laughs> die pretty right, fast. The Avatar world, I would like, die. The Avatar instantly. world, yeah. dead in 10 minutes. <laughs> Any of the worlds in Star Wars, dead in 10 minutes. Oh. Yeah. Lord, Middle Earth, no nope. thank you. Maybe the Shire. Mm, Shire. Shire seems delightful. They just be puffing away with a bunch of little guys. <laughs> I'll say you know? the Shire. Why not? In Lord of the Rings. Okay. All right. Look, I, just so you guys know out there, I play basketball all the time. I'm a huge basketball fan. I myself, and my mom thinks I'm five foot ten. maybe. I play point guard in real life. But if I'm in the universe in Willow, I am playing center and I am dominating every game <laughs> like I'm Shaquille O'Neal. I want to go to the Willow universe. All right. I'm going to live on that weird planet that Krull exists on. 
Die. You're gonna <laughs> no, die. Can't. I'm gonna You're gonna die. die so fast. I can't think of anything. Okay, wait. Like, so, so you took. I took Willow. You took uh, Cr crawl. You took crawl, and you took oh, Lord I of the took Rings. The Shire. Which one of us survives longest? Oh, and I'm in the Shire. Are you kidding me? I I'm think, surviving I think it's the you. Shire. You just I think can't be lives. Right? I'm yeah. just being absorbed by some crystalline spider right now. And if there's Nutrients, any threat to the Shire, you know. Gandalf shows up, keeps things in order. No yeah, problem. We're good. All right. What's next? Angel writes, if you could mash up any movies, what would they be? Mine is The Inception of Elm Street. I, can, I couldn't even answer that. Ooh, that's awesome. The Inception of Elm yeah, Street. Somebody good. write that right now. That sounds yeah. awesome. That's that. That's an interesting one. I would I would need like a half hour to think about it. I'm not going to whip something I out. will say uh, Star-Lord, The Empire uh, <laughs> Kills Thanos? <laughs> 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 All right, what's next? <laughs> you know, think about that one though. I might we we might come back to you. Mr. Mac Cheese writes, "What did you guys think of the Entourage movie?" Uh, you know, I'm telling you right now, I I like the Entourage movie. I went in it. I, I went in it. I went to it. I sat through it. I laughed. I grinned. I chuckled. I came out and I had been entertained. I came out. I uh, Dennis and I talked about this once in a while. When I saw the ravenously negative feedback to it. I'm like, what movie were you people mm. watching? Or what movie did you think this was going to be? Uh, I wasn't a big fan of the show, but uh, what can I say? I went in, I watched it, I giggled, I laughed, I thought it was funny, I had a nice little time. It was in my top 10 movies of the year, absolutely right. not. But it was, uh, it was an entertaining little film, I thought. I didn't see the film. I loved the first couple seasons of Entourage, and I think they missed the window for me wanting to see a film version of it. I'll eventually see it. I did see the turtle versus Ronda Rousey fight online. I thought that was funny. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I like the movie. The movie was exactly what it was supposed to be. It was made to be an entourage, to be a two hour episode. And it was exactly that. So I, I liked it. All right. What's next? Sebastian Fila writes, what do you think would be the next big improvement in the movie theater experience? Good question. See, mm. I'm not into the gimmicks. I, I'm honestly, I don't like 3D. Uh, I don't like the 4D thing. The rumble in the seats is kind of cool. To me, I love the new technology advances that improve what we have. Like the new, like the Dolby Cinema at, at AMC mm. Price, sharper picture, richer colors, deeper blacks, Dolby Atmos, surrounding sound where like rain, you can hear it moving across mm. the theater. I like things that enhance those aspects. Some people have been talking about virtual reality is going to be the next big thing in movies. I actually, I honestly don't think that's going to catch on. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, what would be the next big thing that actually catches on? I, I couldn't tell you. I really don't know. Well, I think the movie going experience needs to be refined a little bit because of the technological advances that have g gone forward and the movies have not caught up with cell phones. People need to not have their cell phones on when you're in a movie theater and a lot of people have their cell phones on and are talking on the phone. And it, 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 it's like it's one thing for you have to get up and go police it by having to go get someone who works there to come back in and then they have to stand there and watch somebody. Those are the things that I would like to see, you know, policed a little bit better. I don't know if it's like you got to check. You have like little slots where you have to check your phone in. you get a key, you come back. It's things like that that are going to enforce the ability to enjoy a film with everyone else in a giant theater. Because I think a lot of people are coming from their home environment and just thinking that because they're with their friends, they're in their living room. But you're not. You're at a movie theater. So I think to make the to make the movie going experience and maintain that it is a special place to go to and enjoy, you have to create a few more defining boundaries. Not that take away, but just enhance. Yeah, I would. I, I also I'm happy to check my cell phone and wait the extra time if nobody else gets one in the movie theater. Ejection seats are also something that I think <laughs> we should look into. And then like everybody has like a little voting thing. And if you hit if, if enough people hit the button, that means that whoever is talking gets ejected out of the movie theater. If you don't want to go that extreme. How about this stop talking thing before the previews come on instead of after the previews come on? I cannot stand when people are still talking during the trailers. It pisses me off to no end. I was I was, I was seeing a movie the other day and just people cackling in the background when I'm trying to watch the Star Wars trailer that was on the big screen. It's like, shut up. There's stuff going on. I got to admit, I, I generally don't mind it when people are talking during the previews. I don't oh. mind with people talking during the previews, but it really irritates me when they're talking. And I hate when people give their little review of the trailer after it's after it's over. Right. Like, oh, that doesn't look good. Oh, thanks for your opinion. <laughs> Isn't that what you do for a living? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but people watch me on YouTube. I'm not forcing it into their homes. <laughs> All right, two more quick ones. We'll do them rapid right. fire. Curtis Lopez writes, any chances for a Peanuts sequel? Yes, absolutely. Making $45 million opening yeah, weekend. That's yeah. probably already happening. Yeah. There's thousands of stories you can tell in the Peanuts universe. Yeah. I'd love to see 20 more. All right, what's next? Santana McNair writes, who is the one actor slash actress who keeps getting work and you just can't understand why? <laughs> oh, wow. I, I think there are a couple of those that I think about. I mean, there are a few that have always been longstanding ones with me but that don't actually get work anymore. Chris Tucker was one of them. Uh, he doesn't get a what? lot of stuff. No, I don't. I don't like Chris. I think he's a great stand-up comedian. I really do. But I you think didn't like him in Silver Linings Playbook? No, I didn't. Oh. No, I didn't actually. I like the movie, but that doesn't mean I like. You were probably talking during the preview, and then yes, you know, that yes, bled absolutely. Into <laughs> yeah, pulled out my phone while he was talking. Um, but I can't think of anybody who's actually still getting work right now that I that I can think. Of. I mean, I know what. I, well, Christian's in the room right now. I know exactly what Christian would say. Jai Courtney. Jai Courtney, ladies and oh, gentlemen. I knew, I knew yep. exactly where he was going to go with that. Um, I, I know a lot of people feel the same way, too. Uh, any, can you think of any off the top of your head before we wrap this up? No, I, I can't think of anybody that I really hate. I'm still trying to think of the, the combining the movie universes and like something really good for that. And yeah, I just right? can't quite. I, I want to put the, the cast from The Naked Gun in something that's serious. I just, I'm not sure what yet. Maybe like Back to the Future. Naked, <laughs> wait, what about Naked Gun Airplane? <laughs> Naked wait, gun that's airplane. the Same. Same. All right, folks, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. A special thank you to all you guys who are watching us live and sending in Twitter questions as well. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies playing at our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Like your entertainment news? Make sure you bookmark Collider.com. Bookmark that site. Visit it every day. Uh, you know, the crack team of writers over there doing a great job of keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of television and of course film speaking of television we got a lot of recap shows on this network we had our Supergirl recap was now online from last night John Schnepp was a special guest that was fun on that panel tonight we got Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and uh, of course my, my recap show that I'm on uh, The Flash as well lots of great stuff making sure you're tuning in for all that fun stuff and I just want to remind you, if my face looks a little more stupid than normal, uh, it's going to be like that for the rest of the month. <laughs> Once again, this year, as I have in years past, I'm participating in No Shave November. So hopefully when you see this stupid looking face, it reminds you, hey, I should go and support cancer research. Head on over to the uh, American Cancer Society or any of the other organizations that fund cancer research. S don't go to Applebee's tonight. Say, you know, what? I'm going to keep that money that I was going to spend at Applebee's tonight. I'm going to send it to the, uh, for cancer research. So please participate in that. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? First of all, you can find this movie, Dancing Beyond the Battle Beyond the Stars. How about that? Uh, it's pretty horrible. I'd pay to uh, see You that. can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp, at tdoslwh.com. You get my movie, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to www.tdoslwh.com. Sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? All right, I'm at the World Famous Laugh Factory tonight doing a very special charity show in Southern California coming out this weekend. I'm in West Palm Beach in Florida. Online at 5150 Ellis, and I have our combo movie, gentlemen. All right. Yeah. Jaws and Point Break. Yeah. You guys like adrenaline <laughs> rushes? See how you do with Bruce. <laughs> I like Wait, it. Wait, Point Jaws. How about that? Jaws Point. Jaws Point. Jaws Point. Like, yeah. And of course, soon to be seen in the upcoming Baywatch movie, the lovely Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? On Twitter and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And of course, you can find me on the various social media networks. Follow me at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.